Good evening and welcome everyone to tonight's MHPN webinar. Uh, it's never too late to diagnose ADHD. My name is Nicola Palfrey. I'm a clinical psychologist and a researcher based in Canberra, Australia. Um, my background is not in this area, so I'm just here to guide the others that know a lot about it. I've worked mainly in with children and young people experiencing trauma, so I'm an interested observer tonight. So firstly, I would like to start by acknowledging and on behalf of MHPN, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands, seas and waterways across Australia in which this webinar is being uh, broadcast in which our webinar presenters are joining us from today. And I wish to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging for the memories, traditions, culture, hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders uh, peoples and welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that are joining us tonight. So tonight we have a fantastic panel of people joining us to talk about this important topic, ADHD in older um Australia is not older necessarily, but in adults. Um, we've sent through the panel bios. So I'm not going to go through them tonight because we want to hear from them and not to spend too much time on them, but I'll just go through very quickly. We have Associate Professor John Kramer, who's a general practitioner joining us, Dr. Maddie Derrick, who's a clinical psychologist offering her perspective, and Dr. Roger Patterson, a psychiatrist as well. So, um, first of all, just to get you to see who we're talking to tonight, I'm just going to start with an overall question. There's many areas that all of you could be involved in, but I'm interested, I'll start with you, John, first, if that's okay. What sparked your interest in this area and built your passion about working in this field? Thanks, Nicola. Um, child number three out of four got a diagnosis at an early age, and then neurodiversity kept rearing its not so ugly head in my extended family and um, I couldn't ignore it. I had to learn more about it. Fantastic. Thank you. So personal and professional perspective from you tonight, John. That's yeah. great. Thank you. How about you, Maddie? What made you interested in this field of work? Uh, same boat as John, actually. It was uh, my eldest uh, realising he had ADHD and my second quickly followed and then uh, and myself um, and our dog, we say, has ADHD too, <laughs> our Labrador. Um, and it's so there's personal investment there in, um, in getting this space functioning uh, for all the people with ADHD out there. Uh, but I think as well, just as a, as a clinical psychologist, it's a really rewarding um, space to work in. You get so much progress and um, work with some really fun characters and have a good time at work in therapy. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Maddie. And Roger, lastly, how about you? What sparked your interest and passion for this area? Yeah, thanks, Nicola. Good to be with everyone this evening. I started in uh, running a residential unit for children 30 years ago, and we had all sorts of difficult kids. And uh, fortunately, I was sharing the consultant load with a paediatrician who one day said to this child we've been battling with for a couple of months, why don't you try a little bit of Ritalin? And uh, my child psychiatry training had been a bit remiss in this. So I said well, I was guided by her, and uh, we started this child on Ritalin, and to my uh, great relief. It was a miracle. Um, but what really got me passionate was this miracle was not mainstream. And uh, I've now spent the last 30 years in mainstreaming uh, this life-changing uh, treatment. Um, and uh, I think we're getting there slowly and hopefully this will be part of that process. Fantastic. Thank you. So we've got a wonderful mix of uh, expertise, professional, personal, um, to share with everyone joining us tonight. So I'm going to run through the bit of housekeeping just to get that out of the way and then we'll get into the juicy stuff. So other than that, let's get into it. So we've been sent through the uh, learning outcomes for tonight. So really what we're looking to understand is the, an exploration of the symptoms experienced by adults who may be affected by ADHD the benefits, why bother getting a diagnosis later in age and a multidisciplinary approach to working with adults living with ADHD. We'll look at the signs and symptoms of ADHD in common co-occurring conditions. That's a hard thing to say. Um, discuss the use of appropriate language so we can fight against stigma and ne negative narratives. <laughs> Goodness me. Um, and people living with adult ADHD as I said, the benefits of a delayed diagnosis and treatment and the benefits of using a multidisciplinary approach. So 
everybody has had the case study. We're not going to recap it in any great detail today because we'll uh, expect that you've had a read of it and the panellists will be taking us through their approach if they were working with a case like this. So without much further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dr John to take us um, into the webinar proper. Thanks very much, John. Thank you, Nicola. Just to, to remind everyone, Rihanna's 36, been married to Ashley, who's a surveyor for eight years. They've got two kids, six and four. She's working part-time as a mental health nurse, and she's run into strife. Um, and as you can see from your knowledge of the case, she needs help now. She's in crisis. Uh, and what can the GP do to help? Because we are typically the first point of call. Um, what resources are available as you scramble to see what you can do to help this woman who is in major strife? Next slide. Okay, so first thing to do is to validate her concerns. Her distress, her angst, it's all absolutely real and it needs to be validated. The last thing she needs is someone to undermine her genuine grief, concern. Um, from a medical perspective, you need to look for other causes of mental health crisis, depression. Are there any threats of self-harm, et cetera? Um, finding out what resources are available immediately to her. So that's personal and professional. Family, everyone has a family and some are more able to assist than others, but you've got to to dig to find out. Uh, I put a range of referrals ASAP given the long waiting time to get in to see just about anybody. So the earlier you get the referrals happening, the shorter, well, it won't make the waiting time shorter, but it'll have the clock ticking down. Um, you do need to keep a regular eye on them because as I said, she's in crisis. Um, these days, thanks to COVID-19, we have telehealth item numbers, and if that's more convenient for the patient, they can be used to monitor things. Uh, one of the early things you'd be doing would be drawing up a mental health plan if there wasn't one existing, which is going to help her with Medicare cost of uh, some of the psychology visits. It's important to bring the nearest and dearest along so Ashley needs to come to the next appointment. There was a, a reference to her child, Louis, having ADHD. Now, we don't know whether he's floridly ADHD, whether he's treated, whether he's under control, whether he's not a major problem. You need to identify what's happening there because one of the ways to get her out of the crisis might be to address one of the needs of her children. Occasionally, some sort of medication might be needed in the short term, and I'm not talking about stimulants. I'm talking about anxiolytics, things, something to help her sleep. Next slide. She needs a team. So GP is the best place to coordinate. She's going to need a psychologist. She's going to need to develop a lot of strategies. ADHD coaching is very important, particularly when you've got more than one ADHD individual in the same house, which is quite common. If you, after you've taken a good history, you think this is undiagnosed ADHD, then you know that she's going to have to see a psychiatrist because she may well need to have a trial of stimulants. A husband and extended family, if there are grandparents around who can take the children off her hands and give her a break, that's respite care. Um, relationship counselling comes into it, not immediately, but uh, if she does proceed to have a simulant trial, then she's going to re have to renegotiate her relationships with all the key people around her. Uh, and also she needs to be offered online education and links to various resources so she can learn more about it. Next slide. So what happens henceforth? While you're waiting for other things to happen, you've got to keep a close eye on her. So you have to monitor her degree of anxiety, uh, pending other reviews. Um, 
you've already initiated a psychiatry referral, but you know from dealing with other patients like this in the past that a psychiatrist is going to want validation evidence from the childhood of this person about um, ADHD type features going right back. So some people do have access to school reports. If there's no access to school reports, sometimes I'll ask a patient to get their parent to write a, a one-page reflection on their childhood. There are questionnaires, of course. We have the ASRS, uh, which is a fairly simple one. A DIVA 2.0 is freely available. Um, she needs to be given access to information. Um, after you've done your referrals, it's wise to make sure that the referrals have been received and appointments are in place so that you know how long you have to support the patient before the other people can kick in, as I've said below. So that involves booking a series of GP visits. Some of those could be on the phone via telehealth. I mentioned Louis. We don't know the status of his ADHD. If it's a problem, addressing that or getting it addressed uh, is a very important thing. In the very long term, she may come back to the GP or similar prescribing if she's been confirmed to have the diagnosis of ADHD and the psychiatrist wants to send her back to a normal GP. Next slide. Okay, access, the elephant in the room. We all deal with this. It's one thing to recognise the crisis. It's another thing altogether to get the services mobilised and the patient seen. So waiting time. Many, many months for psychiatry. Now, it's not their fault. There aren't enough of them. It costs. So if somebody can't afford six, seven, eight, nine hundred dollars for an initial visit, they're going to be struggling. They've got to see someone that actually knows what they're doing when they get there. Um, in the COVID age, we've had a fortunate kick on to telehealth. Uh, virtual assessment can work quite well for some of these patients. Uh, and coming back to the elephant in the room, I have to mention the absence of public sector mental health access for ADHD adults. That's a structural problem, a major structural problem in our healthcare system. Everybody here would be aware of that, and we have to try and do what we can to change it. Next slide. So while we're holding the fort, what can we do? Well, we've got a whole family here, so we have to look at all of their needs. And I've mentioned if the ADHD six-year-old isn't well controlled, we might be picking up the phone and trying to seek an early paediatric review for that child. Um, Mobilising support networks. If they're extended family members close by, bring them in. Support groups, so ADHD Foundation, ADHD Australia and so on. Coaches can, if they're not overworked, can respond more quickly than many professionals. It's important to confirm that the appointments are actually going to happen. Um, if Brianna is so disabled that she can't manage at home, then her husband should be allowed to take some care leave from work and you might need to provide certificates for that. Uh, as time goes by, the referral that you've done for the psychiatrist can be enhanced by bringing back questionnaires that you've had completed, uh, school reports, etc. Uh, and I've touched on using telehealth to monitor the condition. Next slide. Maddie, it's your turn. Over to me. Thank you, John. Uh, so I want to just very quickly start with um, pointing out some things that jump out of the case study to me. Uh, if Brianna hadn't been questioning ADHD herself and her refer referral to me as a psychologist was for something else, um, these particular factors in her um, presentation would be um, alerting me that I need to consider ADHD amongst everything else there. 
uh, the older someone with ADHD is, the further removed their presentation seems to get from DSM criteria. Um, and this is more so the case for females and um, also the case with people with uh, higher than average intelligence. We can get a lot of compensatory measures that people develop over time, whether they're aware that um, they're, they're using them or not, uh, and also masking that uh, can make it hard to see the symptoms or the, or the symptoms even look counterintuitive. A um, great example being um, uh, someone with ADHD saying, I'm so disorganised, and their friend uh, saying to them, but you're the most organised person I know, you're obsessively organised. That's a really common um, thing we hear. Um, with uh, the secondary outcomes of ADHD, what, what happens when it's unrecognised and unsupported, untreated, um, we can end up with um, some coping habits, maladaptive coping particularly, which can start to look like other conditions. And this is where we uh, can get a lot of misdiagnoses with ADHD. Uh, next slide, please. So I've pulled out uh, the conditions that Brianna in our uh, case has been diagnosed with in the past. I think this is a really good set to, um, as an example, to highlight um, common things we see on referrals uh, for people seeking ADHD assessment. And this particular set is uh, very relevant to uh, women. And I should say um, as well with some of these, I keep saying women and females, um, there is, uh, we're increasingly aware of higher rates of gender divergence amongst people with neurodivergence. I do want to acknowledge that when I'm saying women and females, I, I do uh, think that should be relevant to non-binary people as well. Um, I've got a lot of information on this slide and the next one. Um, so I'm just going to point out a few key things and I'll leave the rest uh, for you to read at your leisure. Um, with borderline um, personality disorder, uh, this is one that a lot of women with ADHD will collect up before the ADHD diagnosis, often around the age of 18, 19. And if we think developmentally where uh, females are at this time in life in terms of their life context, they're experiencing adult relationships in more sophisticated and intimate ways, uh, but you couple that with uh, emotion dysregulation and impulsivity and novelty seeking, um, and we start to get a pattern of experiences uh, that looks like borderline personality disorder. Uh, but if we wait a couple of years, that can often um, change that point. A, another uh, pivotal time for women is having children. Um, so if you think of what uh, staying at home with a baby 24-7 looks like, it's absolute kryptonite for the ADHD brain. Oh, thank you. Next slide. Oh, no, sorry. Back, uh, back one slide. Wasn't quite ready for the next one. Thanks. Um, it's, you know, the, the task of looking after a baby, it's monotonous, it's repetitive, doesn't matter how cute they are, uh, or changing nappies, pushing bottles, etc. It, it There's nothing, uh, there's no fuel in that for the ADHD brain that really relies on reward centre, re reward pathway activation to get energised and activated. Um, so for a, a woman with ADHD, it can be very draining every day chronically to get through that important but boring stuff um, and we see burnout really quickly and we'll see low motivation, low mood, um, perhaps a lot of anger, perhaps numbness and then we can end up with postnatal depression diagnosis which may genuinely be co-occurring or it may be secondary to the ADHD. Uh, next slide, thank you. Social anxiety is probably the most common um, thing that I see on referrals in terms of co-occurring or, or pre-existing conditions. Um, with ADHD, I don't think I've ever worked with an individual who hasn't developed a learned hypervigilance to negative judgment over time through their experiences. And this will commonly present itself in um, by replaying social events and interactions over and over in their mind, ruminating, very hyper-focused. Um, and checking and thinking about um, ways that they've possibly offended someone. There's been a faux pas, they've forgotten someone's birthday or someone's mother died or or uh, they didn't apologise enough for being late or someone misinterpreted what they said um, and has taken offence. And um, when there is something detected, that embarrassment and shame can be a really intense feeling and it can very much look like anxiety, but it... it um, there's a different pattern that plays out compared to a, a genuine distinct social anxiety. I'll leave you to read the rest 
here for those other ones. Next slide, please. So um, the benefit of getting a diagnosis and intervention is, of course, what we all want, quality of life and wellbeing. Um, this little chart here put together to try and highlight that um, when we combine pharmacological intervention with non-pharmacological intervention, we're really optimising that opportunity. There's a synergy uh, that happens. I talk for hours about all the details of how. Um, but it's, it's a worthwhile pursuit at any age. It's not just about improving functioning. It's not the point of diagnosis and intervention alone. Um, I find that it's about improving how comfortable someone is in their own skin. And even the later stages of life where there's not a lot of demands on you, everyone wants to feel comfortable in their own skin. Um, and it's sometimes the case that um, people have been dismissed in their concerns because um, it's been said, oh, well, you're about to retire or your children have left home and, and you know, there's not too, so much demand on you now, whereas um, I think there is this other aspect that people need to consider. Um, next slide, please. And this is an excerpt from a piece of writing that a client of mine wrote. I think it really beautifully, she writes beautifully, uh, captures um, the what diagnosis achieves and particularly the very important and meaningful um, role that, that shift in self-concept that happens, that movement towards feeling comfortable in your own skin. Uh, next slide, please. So to get there and to get that, um, to get to that lovely final self-actualization stage of, of therapy from a non-pharmacological perspective, at least, um, we've got some tough roads ahead because we have the very deficit, uh, heavy model of the DSM to work within. Even the name ADHD in itself uh, carries a deficit load with it, um, and we've got a whole lot of stigma and public debate. Um, so I think it's important right from the get-go to um, be very conscious and methodical in working against that all the way through and, and buffering against those negative narr narratives. And for me, the starting point is to name it up, as uh, John pointed out, to, um, to validate them. Um, this is a really, really key stage. And for some clients, it's quick. They've done a lot of it themselves. For others, that they need to spend a fair bit of time there. And there can be all sorts of grief that comes up. And you, you can't hurry things and move forward until that person's been able to have that moment to process sufficiently. Um, from there, I find it really, really helpful to use an environment fit framework. Uh, so rather than discussing uh, challenges due to the cognitive profile inherent in the person, uh, we talk about challenges that are created due to the interplay between their cognitive profile, or that a particular aspect of their cognitive profile, and the environment and what it's demanding of them. And uh, we tend to talk about self-regulation uh, to summarise all the um, parts of ADHD. Um, so if we use that environment for fit framework, then uh, we can talk about the challenges and then in a really balanced way switch to talking about the strengths and the opportunities with that exact same aspect of their cognitive profile and talk about environments where um, that uh, could instead lead to a really positive outcome for them. Likewise with coping, we definitely uh, work doing a bit of an audit on, on their coping habits and, and looking for the less adaptive coping and trying to replace that with more adaptive coping. But equally, perhaps even more so, we're identifying what they have been able to do um, to cope and to survive and do as well as they have. And people with ADHD due to strengths in their typical profile are really, really resourceful and uh, have often done some amazing things and just need some help to be able to recognise that themselves. That's it from me. Thanks, uh, Nicola. Over to you, Roger. Thanks, Maddie. Uh, I'm going to say a few words generally about ADHD, and I'm going to take most of my evidence from the recently released guideline put out by the Australian Association, uh, Australian ADHD Professional Association. When I say recent, it's only a few weeks ago, but you can get it on the on the ADPA website, free and uh, downloadable. Next slide, please. Just to reinforce what uh, other people have said today, that language is important and we should talk about lived experience and uh, and care and difference in neurodiversity rather than 
some of the old-fashioned stigma and pejorative language, uh, such as naughty brat, <laughs> trying to avoid that, and other things. Next slide, please. Now, is concentrating important, which is a fundamental aspect of ADHD after all? Well, yes. If you get out of bed each morning and uh, have trouble concentrating, your day is going to be stressful from the get-go. And it, uh, as we've seen in the case of Brianna, if you can't concentrate, it gets in the way of all sorts of school, work, family, life event situations. You, you've got to be able to organise and cope, otherwise it leads on to all sorts of uh, comorbidity. Um, and often people seek solace with substance abuse, so we've heard the history in her family. It's very expensive. Untreated ADHD in Australia costs the Australian economy $20 billion, estimated by a Deloitte report. That's $20 billion, which is a lot of money. It's quite common, 800,000 people, children 5%, adults 2.5%. So you can see that adults sort of seem to grow out of it a bit, although I suspect they just learn how to manage and cope with and focus on their strengths rather than their weaknesses. A few more boys and girls in kids. In adults, it's pretty pretty one-to-one uh, -one with males and females. And the rates of medication, people often say we're over-prescribing. In fact, we're generally under-prescribing, which is uh, what we're trying to do with this mainstreaming exercise and other things, is to try and get the prescribing rate somewhere up near the actual prevalence rate. As you see, children are 2%, prevalence rate 5%, adults prescribing rate 0.3%, adults 2.5%. So we're way, way under in adults, and um, we need to do something about that. Without it, there's all sorts of costs to productivity, educational, justice system costs, health system costs, etc. Next slide, please. Just to remind us that it's called attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, but it's really attention dysfunction because a lot of patients with ADHD can concentrate, but only if they're really interested and they can hyperfocus, which can be a problem. And if they're bored, they sort of switch off completely. So it's full on or full off when really uh, a concentration should be like a dimmer switch, a bit on, a bit off, not... Um, one way or the other. And the common features that we heard, apart from the concentration, some people are very overactive and some are more dreamy, and there are the stress, impatience, temper, and comorbidity, which is the key thing, as Maddie was pointing out, is the rule. A lot of other associated conditions emerge with, with adults presenting. They've had a lifetime of stress, and it's no wonder they end up with all sorts of other conditions. Next slide, please. John mentioned some of the questionnaires. In children, the SNAP4 is popular because it's free. A lot of pediatricians use the Connors uh, in youth and adults, ASRS, which I use a lot, or the DIVA-5, a uh, structured diagnostic interview. I tend to screen for emotional dysregulation as well, which is very common in ADHD. I use the DAS, but there's other questionnaires there. The DAS is free and um, readily available. Next, please. And there's the ASRS if they tick. These are the first six questions. In the DSM-5, there's 18 questions for ADHD. This is the first six, which is the most important screen. If they get four out of six in the grey area, they're very likely to have ADHD. Next slide, please. And the other 12 questions are there. If they keep ticking a few of those grey boxes, it's looking very likely. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Just a few words on the etiology. What we're finding really is the ADHD brains. It's sort of a good news story because... They are underactive, they are immature, but they get there. Uh, the good news is, especially for women, they tend to get there a bit earlier, 25 for females. The male brains mature around 30 or never, <laughs> unfortunately for some males. And uh, stimulant medication and may well help this maturing process rather than hinder it. So it's important that we, we note that medication does not get in the way. Next, please. Now, before I get into medication, it's important that my patients understand what they're talking about. So we talk about psychoeducation and accommodations and lifestyle, all the stuff that was Maddie was talking about. I do it uh, briefly, and then they really need to spend much more time with psychologists and coaches doing it extensively. Next, please. For instance, um, the questions often put to the first interview. Um, my dad says that ADHD is not real. Well, he's likely to have it and is in denial. What are the causes? We don't know but it is a bit genetic. Uh, is it their fault? No, that's very important. Uh, they've been blamed for all sorts of things, but this is not their fault. Will they grow out of it? Possibly. What's the best treatment? A combination of medication and therapy, and often in that order, because once the patients are medicated, they do better in therapy. They're likely to need to be on medication throughout their schooling, 
And then often mid twenties or so, they may be able to start coming off their medication. It'll turn them into a zombie if they're taking too much, and it's all about fine tuning the medication to get it just right. Uh, unfortunately, I say to my patients, this, this medication is not addictive, and you'll have to remind yourself to take it. Um, so no, it is not addictive. Next, please. And there's more things we talk about. Um, there is positive aspects of getting the diagnosis. A lot of patients go through a grief and adjustment process. Quite a few patients are in tears at the first interview, thinking, oh, how my life could have been different if only I'd actually been treated much earlier. And we, we discuss various environmental education, employment issues, social issues. Be careful about substance misuse. A lot of patients abuse alcohol and marijuana, especially to try and calm the busy brain. And especially for my teenage patients who are learning how to drive, they must be very careful to take their medication at all times to improve their concentration. Next, please. Next, please. So, again, some lifestyle modifications. I won't go through the whole list, but it's important that ADHD treatment is seen as fine tuning. The patients need to be able to have the basics of life right. They need to be sleeping, exercising, calm, in a good workplace, getting help for their there are other issues of addiction, integration, eating well. And when everything's going well, then the medication has the best chance to work because it's very much a fine-tuning medication. Next, please. As they say, ADHD is easy to treat but hard to treat well. The, the stimulant medication and other medications are generally broadly helpful, but to get them just right requires um, extra effort on the part of the therapist. Next, please. The medications that are particularly effective are the stimulant medications. Um, they're effective. They help wake up. Well, the analogy we use is the brain is like an orchestra, but there's a sleepy, in inactive part of the brain, the inferior prefrontal cortex, but particularly, which needs to be woken up so the whole brain, the conductor can take charge of the whole brain. Dexamphetamine and methylphenidate are the two most um, helpful. Dexamphetamine invented in 1940, and now we have some long-acting forms, uh, Vyvanse and um, uh, compounded dexamphetamine, and methylphenidate invented in 1950 to copy dexamphetamine. And we have some long-acting ones, Ritalin, LA, and Concerta. Next, please. And they're very effective. As you can see at this table of medications, methylphenidate and amphetamines are way up the top with very good, powerful effect sizes. Atomoxetine, guanfacine, the two other medications we use are also fairly high up. Look at where SSRIs for depression, considered effective, not so good. And antipsychotics for schizophrenia, 0.25. Next, please. They are effective and they are very clean. They're a pleasure to work with. The only tricky thing is to get the dose right. So I'm Dr. Fine Tune, the Goldilocks method, where not too, not too hot, not too cold, just right. We have to get the dosage just right with this titration over the first days and weeks, aiming for that sweet spot. Maximum help, minimum side effects. So I see my patients very frequently for the first six months and then gradually space them out once we've decided what the dose is. I keep an eye on the blood pressure and weight, particularly in, in kids. Adults don't mind losing a few kilos, but in kids we worry about it. Uh, that's probably one of the most common side effects. Loss of appetite and, and height starts to slow. If height starts to slow, we've got to do something about it. Long-term use is justified as long as it's effective. So occasionally we have little breaks just to make sure it still is effective. Next, please. Now, if Dex doesn't work, we try Ritalin. If that doesn't work, we try the long-acting ones. We just move, we keep moving around until we find something that's that's helpful. I tend to, with my patients, I start them on Dexamphetamine for the first week and a long-acting Dexamphetamine, Liz Dexamphetamine Vyvanse for the second week. So when I see them in two weeks' time, they will have had a trial of a short and long-acting at varying doses to see what suits them. I try and see them within two weeks. Sometimes that's not possible for some patients who are fair way away, but often my patients are now doing a lot of telehealth. So I usually try and be fairly prompt for my first review appointment. For the, um, if, if after the first few weeks, they're not doing well on the DEX or long acting DEX, we switch around and try Ritalin and long acting Ritalin. So within the first month, they've usually had a trial of most of the medications. For the little ease, uh, I tend to start with methylphenidate. It's a little bit gentler and uh, not so many side effects. But for mid-teens and adults onwards, I always start with dexamphetamine. Next, please. And we continue titrating over the first few months. And ideally, patients stabilize on the 
long acting one, but sometimes they prefer the short acting. But long acting formulations are always better, particularly for school kids, a more even effect, less misuse. The final medication I find with a lot of my patients is a combination of some days the long acting, some days they go back to the short acting. Sometimes they use the short acting to kickstart the day, then take their long acting, or maybe top up at the end of the day. Next, please. And long-term use is, is uh, the good news is that people don't change their dose much. And I can see a lot of my patients six monthly or even longer with GP involvement. Some patients talk about the medication wearing off and tolerance occasionally happens, but not very often. How often? Well, one in 30 of my patients, I guess. And those patients are instructed to take some breaks, one day a week, a few days a month, or a few weeks a year. It reboots and resets the system. Next slide, please. There are other medications, just to finish off with the last few slides. Atomoxetine, uh, once daily, originally an antidepressant, but uh, had some good attentional uh, properties. That's probably my next line. Guanfacine has come in over the last few years. Often very useful as an adjunctive, given in the evening, helps with the emotional dysregulation and with the concentration. I use clonidine a lot to help my patients wind down at the end of the day. And also it winds down the hyperactivity of ADHD and also winds down the effect of stimulant medication. Very useful old fashioned blood pressure pill, not addictive, not dangerous and cheap. Sometimes we look at some of the stimulating antidepressants and John was talking about what he can pres prescribe as a GP while they're waiting. And uh, some of the antidepressants such as uh, bupropion, Cyban, fluoxetine can be stimulating, uh, can be very helpful. Next, please. Now, the good news is the medications for ADHD are cheap. Um, they, uh, hang on, that's, I think that's the wrong heading for this particular slide. But uh, the, this is a slide about the cost. And the medications are very cheap, which is good news. Ritalin and Dex are cheap for all ages. We run into slight problems if uh, adults were diagnosed uh, over the age of 18 when it becomes more expensive. Under 18, you can still get them cheaply. But over 18, for newly diagnosed adults like Brianna, she may be paying a bit more for um, Ritalin LA, Concerta, and uh, atomoxetine, but they're not horrendously expensive, which is good news. Next slide, please. There's going to be some handouts that I give lots of my patients handouts because you're chatting to them, they're really in a state of shock after the first uh, appointment and adjusting, as I say, the grief at the, uh, at the diagnosis and uh, the lost opportunity. So handouts are important and they will be handed out to you after the talk. Next, please. This is a busy slide, but the good news is if you're going to be prescribing it for those prescribers out there on this webinar, look up your state and look up what you need to do in terms of getting permission and how to liaise with GPs, whether they need a urine drug screen, what ages you're allowed to treat, um, are stimulants allowed for other conditions other than ADHD? Well, yes, most states allow them for depression and um, bivance for uh, um, binge eating disorder. And there are maximum doses there uh, set by the states. Most of them have maximum doses. So that's on the ADPA website that you can go there and that's available for you. Next slide, please. And now the alternative therapies. The good news is they, well, there are no, not many great alternative therapies, in particular neurofeedback um, as, is still up in the air as to whether it's, it's useful or not. And the other ones you can see there, they're tried but not terribly successful compared to the proven therapies of medication and cognitive behaviour therapy and coaching. Next slide, please. Now, of course, we've mentioned that mainstreaming has happened. That's been my life's task over the last 30 years. In some ways, we're getting quite successful at it now, but that's a problem because demand now outstrips supply. So we're trying to get more paediatricians and psychiatrists. We're trying to get more GPs co-prescribing. And... Uh, Watch this space. I think things are going to free up over the next year or two. Next, please. And final slide, all of you are encouraged to join the Australian ADHD Professional Association. You can be a full associate or student. There's room for everybody. And we're trying to make sure that there's um, uh, evidence-based research, diagnosis, treatment and management of ADHD for everyone's benefit. As we say, um, bad practice anywhere is a threat to good practice everywhere. So 
Um, I think that's it for me. Uh, we'll hand back to Nicola. Beautiful. Thank you, everybody. Um, that's a lot of information to take in, um, but it's lovely to hear everyone's perspective and hopefully we've got quite a bit of time for Q&A. So um, we'll pick up on some of the questions and, and get into them if that's okay. So I will run through some of the ones that we've come through. If you've got questions, remember you can put them in the um, question. Uh, an answer section and send them through and I'll receive them here. I've got a quick one, which I think, Roger, it may you may be best placed to answer. There's a question about the ASRS. Is that also used for autism screening? No, it's it's just the 18 items of the um, in the DSM-5 for, for ADHD. So, uh, no, it, and it's freely available, but no, it's not for autism. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Now, this has come through from a number of people. I can't name them all. It's probably half a dozen or eight questions from different individuals asking about ADHD coaching. Um, what is it? Who does it? What's what's involved? So, I think um, you've all mentioned it individually. Um, I don't know if anyone particular, but I might start with you, John. You mentioned it to start off with. Could you give the audience a little bit of an idea of who might be an ADHD coach? What ADHD coach? What do they do? And, and how might people access them? Yes, I'm fairly new, but I'm becoming a convert. Um, given that when there's an ADHD individual in a house, there'll probably be some others, and therefore the household is chaotic, some way to bring order into that chaos, structure, routine, can help everybody to function better. Now, that's not a health discipline, but it's common sense. Uh, the ADHD individual just can't manage that due to their executive dysfunction. So having somebody who can come in as an outsider and have greater credibility and help to create more functional routines uh, within a household can be very, very effective. Can I just add to that, uh, John? Yes. That was uh, – sure. I'm, I'm often told by my coaching colleagues that um, – Pills don't teach skills. Pills don't teach skills. So my pills help the brain improve so it's ready to function, but then they've got to learn various things that they should have learned from a young age. They've got to play a quick catch-up. And uh, so the, they go off and see coaches and psychologists to learn strategies and skills so they can quickly come up to speed with their organisational skills and time management and uh, relationship skills, etc. Another way of putting that is you've got to reach them to teach them. Yes. That's great. Um, Maddie, did you want to add in? Yes, look, just um, from the perspective of the guidelines, the clinical guidelines that came out, um, ADHD uh, coaching was recommended as, as that could be done. Um, it's one of those things where anecdotally you get a great coach and they do amazing work with people um, that it's early stages for ADHD coaching in terms of research. We just don't have enough studies um, to, to back that up sufficiently at this point point to have given that a really strong recommendation in the guidelines. Um, but something to note is that a, a lot of what ADHD coaches do when they're doing good effective stuff with ADHD uh, does sit within um, part of a CBT framework and um, there's more information about this in the guidelines. Um, so for, and because ADHD and, and allied health um, professionals will incorporate aspects of ADHD coaching, but of course it, it's much harder. So ADHD coaches are a fantastic resource. They're a lot more available at the moment. Um, if people are referring their patients and clients to coaches, it um, it's tricky because they're, it's um, not regulated in the same way as things are for health professionals. Um, so perhaps just having some conversations with your patient or your client about uh, what they're working on, what's being covered and, and checking that in the guidelines just to be sure that, yes, this coach is obviously very well trained and um, and is doing a good job with your, your person you're referring. Great, thank you. Um, I've got a question that's come through in multiple different ways, but I'm trying to pull them together. So thank you for everyone who sent questions. I can't go through all of them, but I'm trying to kind of synthesise themes. I might stick with you, Maddie, just to start off with, and then we, we can throw to um, 
the others as well, uh, to Roger and John, we've talked a lot about comorbidity. Um, from a psychologist's perspective, where do you start? Uh, in terms of teasing out diagnosis-wise, what's happening? Yeah, or where to, how to where, where to start? It could be, feel very overwhelming for a patient who's coming in, and now, as you say, they might come in with all the letters after their name. Yes, um, they've been helpfully attributed over the years, and we've all seen that. And then, if yeah. ADHD gets uh, added, how do you know where to start with a patient once? Because we talked about that grief and overwhelm and so forth. So, do you have a new yeah. strategy to help unpack that for people? I think it helps that um, often if you are adding the letters ADHD to the list of conditions, you're probably taking a few others away in the process. And if you if you are explaining ADHD um, in a way to a client and they're not identifying it, it's, it's not gelling for them and they're not having huge penny drop moments, then you're probably barking up the wrong tree because what invariably happens is at this point at least until we've had this huge increase in awareness around ADHD, um, people have gone through every other diagnosis searching for themselves for an answer for something that, that's that and felt right and seemed to explain their difficulties um, and whether they came across ADHD or it's something you've started gently discussing with them. Um, I, I find it, it's always a huge relief um, and if, if you are barking up the right tree, then just that recognition and, and people very genuinely are quite blown away by how could this have not been picked up before, this makes so much sense and nothing else quite did. Um, so I, I guess I, I don't find it difficult uh, to bring up, where it can be difficult to bring up is with a parent who's um, not ready to look at that for their child. Um, and then, yeah, we need to tread carefully. We need to talk about focusing on the outcomes that we can achieve and, and dispelling some of the myths and the stigma. It's probably worth saying that most of my patients come in already having had a label of anxiety or depression, often on an antidepressant as well. And then we discover that ADHD is a primary problem and when we start the ADHD treatment with medication and therapy, often their emotional issues seem to just melt away and they can come off the antidepressant. That is, the emotional difficulties were secondary to untreated underpinning ADHD and not a, a primary comorbidity. I mean, sometimes not. Some patients you know, have their ADHD treated perfectly and yet they've still got a coexisting anxiety or depressive illness that needs treatment in its own right. But it's important to make that distinction between uh, a primary or a secondary associated emotional disorder. Thank you. John, did you have anything to add to that um, conversation? Um, just that it's it's not uncommon to find an adult that has been previously diagnosed with bipolar disorder and when you go into the fluctuations in the mood, you realise that these are things happening on a daily basis rather than a weekly basis uh, and that the original diagnosis needs to be reconsidered completely. Um, the other thing I'd mention, once in a while, you'll encounter an adult that is functionally illiterate. Uh, they may or may not have behavioural or mental health issues, uh, but these are the people that have slipped through the system with dyslexia, whatever else, and fortunately they've managed to survive because there's been enough scaffolding around them but they just never learned to read or write. And if you can go into the background, you will often find that it's something like dyslexia uh, and ADHD is one of the common comorbidities to that condition. Great, thank you. Um, as a bit of a jumping off point from that, and I wonder, um, Roger, if you want to address it, there's been a question in the chat about medication with a patient who may we believe have uh, meet the criteria for ADHD, but has also had episodes of mania. Yes, you've got to be pretty careful uh, in that situation. Um, as John was saying, sometimes bipolar can masquerade uh, as ADHD, but if you think that um, they may well have a, a manic uh, illness as well, then that really needs to be brought under control and then you can tackle the ADHD 
And it's worth tackling because if you manage their ADHD and generally decrease the amount of stress in their life, that's likely to lead to less manic episodes in the future. So it's not a uh, contraindication, but you first must stabilize the mania or full-blown bipolar disorder or even psychosis in certain situations if they've had a brief drug-induced psychosis for instance, stabilise that before addressing the uh, the ADHD. Yeah, so it's all that um, comprehensive assessment, I suppose, and history taking and why those different multiple sources could be really important and as you're kind of gathering the information and, and history taking of people. Yeah, I, look, um, I can't stress enough what John said involving relatives. I mean, I involve, I've got a child psychiatry background, so I'm used to inviting relatives in, but even my adult patients, I say, you know, first interview, please bring someone along with you. And often they keep coming with them, which I think is a fantastic resource for ongoing support and uh, information. So my adult psychiatry colleagues are probably not that used to having um, nearest and dearest in the room as well as the patient, but I would urge them to uh, adapt their practice. for the. And in fact, in general, I think it's in general psychiatry, I think it's used not just for ADHD. Thank you. There's again a lot of a lot of questions coming through, and we won't get through them all. But a couple of common themes, one of which is, again, co comorbidities or co-diagnosis or interaction, I suppose, between the two. And the first one that's come through a, a number of times, not unexpectedly, is the the role or interplay between exposure to childhood trauma or complex PTSD and ADHD, and I know this has been a topic for a long time, um, so I'm wondering if anybody wants to weigh in on that in terms of, again, disentangling maybe early childhood experiences of adversity and trauma with some of the symptomatology of ADHD and how we might address that. Anyone want to leap in first? Or okay. like, go <laughs> I'm happy to. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess when we think um, that there's a few angles on this, we think about intergenerational patterns of ADHD but that's unrecognised and unmanaged and what can happen there. The secondary um, outcomes, particularly if substance use is, is a coping mechanism, um, then amongst, uh, if we looked at a cohort, of, a cohort of children with trauma, I'd expect we'd find higher rates of ADHD if we had a really concrete biological marker that we could easily pull out to disentangle the two. Having said that, there's plenty of people around with ADHD without any trauma at all. Um, I think the way I hope I'm speaking on behalf of uh, other clinicians here as well in, in suggesting that if you have a genetic vulnerability there for ADHD and experience trauma, then it's much more likely that ADHD is going to be expressed and, and expressed with more severity than it might have been without the trauma. I think from an intervention perspective, um, uh, something that sort of always comes up is people, you know, wanting to disentangle, but is it ADHD or is it trauma? And I kind of feel like at the end of the day, if we've got those symptoms of ADHD, um, then why wouldn't we treat them uh, regardless of, of where the cause has come about? We're talking about something that um, has happened with the development of the brain. Um, that is, is different, either end of the bell curve. And um, it, to me, it, it's a bit, um, it's not useful to, to uh, delay ADHD treatment because we're thinking it may just be trauma. And what I think this is probably tied up in is actually a bit of stigma and the idea that bad parenting creates uh, what people might think is ADHD. And uh, so the parents that cause the trauma, if the parents just get some parenting uh, uh, guidance, do courses and uh, get, you know, supports, then um, that will somehow magically turn the child, child's brain neurotypical. Yeah. Thank you. I think you make a really good point, which we see a lot and it, from different angles. So I often am coming at it from that tra trauma background and people can get caught up on whether or not or how big or not um, the trauma, capital T, little t, might be. And it, it's less about that and more about what actually supports the child yeah. at a young person. So, yeah. Nicola, I'd like to comment. Please go. Um, I have a number of PTSD patients, typically police officers and AMBOs. And in recent times when I've learned of this link between trauma and ADHD, I've started to inquire uh, of the of the individual about their childhood and 
school experiences and so forth. And I, I can think off the top of my head of about four. Now, this is an N equal four trial. It's not particularly <laughs> scientific, but in four of those cases, uh, they've had a, at least one child diagnosed and treated with stimulants for ADHD. So there's a definite link. I don't know what, what it is, whether the ADHD individual is more vulnerable to stress, to trauma, but I'd like to see some studies done on it. If they uh, exist, I'd love to hear about them, but I suspect they may not have been done. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that there are increased, uh, there is increased vulnerability to PTSD when you have ADHD. And from the lived experience perspective, I think the uh, in intrusive imagery and the difficulty with controlling your attention and where it goes and being able to switch off replaying a car accident, for example, that, that probably um, adds to, to the development of PTSD alongside whatever gen genetic vulnerability is there. But it's also interesting, John, that you, um, we're talking about uh, police and AMBOs because there is a concentration of people with ADHD amongst emergency services, in emergency wards, in hospitals, any uh, environment that um, where there's crises, you need to respond quickly. It's not about necessarily planning long, long into the future. Um, those are environments that uh, people with ADHD seem to thrive in. Thank you. Yes, um, that's, that's right. And I've, I've also heard it said that um, the ADHD individual thrives in a crisis and actually does very well in an emergency mm. situation. They may unravel afterwards, but they're extremely competent during the event. Yes. As a, as an ADHD, uh, I was just going to say, we always joke at our house about, uh, my husband says, well, I'll be right in the zombie apocalypse with all the ADHDers in the house to look after me. <laughs> I would say as someone who's married to a chef, uh, there's a fair few in the hospitality industry as well <laughs> where it's really useful to be able to manage a lot of things at once and, and have competing demands. Um, Roger, did you have anything to add on that, that topic or should we move on to the millions of other questions we have? No, no, let's keep moving. That was well addressed. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Okay, one of the things, there's still lots of co questions on coaching coming through and more information, so I don't know if we can maybe send out some more information or if there's anything else. I think people are kind of, I don't know if we've conceptualised it enough for them. So if there's, I think there's a, is there a register of coaches or I know, Maddie, you talked about, you know, wanting to make sure that a coach is a coach is a coach, you know, what the yes. credentials and so forth are. So would we direct them to the guidelines? Yes, to the guidelines yeah. and... Um, Roger, is it International Coaching Federation? If I got yes, no, the right yeah, there's, there is a register and we can attach that to um, one of the handouts after That's this great. session. That's great. That is fantastic. Um, the other comorbidity that people are asking about is autism and ADHD. So, again, I'll throw it out to the panel, anyone who wants to start, kick off that conversation around comorbidity mm -hmm. or differential diagnosis with um, young people or adults who may have both Query both those sorts of things. So yeah. anyone want to? Nicola, the, the figure that sticks in my mind is that approximately fifty percent of ASD individuals will have ADHD. Now, whether it's sixty or forty or fifty doesn't really matter. If you've got an ASD individual, you've really got to look hard to see if the ADHD is there. So assume maybe you know look, yeah. look just prove it rather, rather than, rather than yeah. okay. prove it. Yeah. Great, thank you. But there's uh, it's a tricky differential, big Venn diagram we're always drawing up in supervision to nut out the questions to differentiate the two. Um, but most of the time, if we're at the point of considering ASD as a differential, we're probably at the point of considering it as co-occurring. Um, or often a, a common outcome of an assessment might be um, ADHD with ASD traits, or ASD with ADHD traits, um, but yeah, the crossover between the two is enormous. That that executive functioning impact is um, is uh, sits with both. And again, I think one of the things when we're talking about all these um, the the comorbidities, the conditions, or the, the ways that people move through the world, it it can be unhelpful to split them all out, don't you think? And, and are there things that you think across all of these could be core components that each of you would speak with, with your patients or clients, um, 
about quality of your life and functioning and so forth. Does that make sense? I feel like sometimes we're like, oh, it's not that, it's this, it's not that. So then we have to shift everything. But actually core skills or adaptations, you guys have talked a lot about that they have them already. Are there certain things that can be helpful to move away from specificity in a way into making people feel like they already have some competence? Does that make sense as a question? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think key um, things that you often work with your patients about to help them feel um, to, to do that coaching and adaptation along with medication. Um, oh, I thought I'd understood the question, but I've just lost it now. Sorry, Nicola. <laughs> Maybe if John or Roger were following, they could answer. Well, yeah, 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 go, Roger. A, I mean, it's a ASD and ADHD, as John said, they, they overlap a lot. And uh, it's important for us to detect it, particularly when when the patients and their families looking for support. NDIS will support ASD, but they won't support ADHD, unfortunately. And um, so, and ADHD tends to be more, much more responsive to medication, of course, and uh, ADHD and ASD more to behavioural strategies. So, yes, there's an important comorbidity, and people are still slipping through. I mean, I saw a couple of adults at the end of last week. And they came along. They'd never been diagnosed with ASD, but just just chatting to them, they clearly had the good old fashioned Asperger's style of interacting, and um, and they they warmed to the diagnosis. They said, "Oh, that explains why people find me a little bit unusual in that I usually monologue about my favourite interests rather than joining in a conversation appropriately." And uh, and they didn't want to take it any further. They were just appreciative of the psychoeducation, and they understood where they were coming from. So, yes, it's important to be aware of these things for all sorts of reasons. I think probably something I could add, um, Nicola, is that the just in the the time that I've been in this space in the last seven years, um, there's been a movement away from um, ADHD treatment being very strategy strategies focused and trying to correct to normal, um, and more getting on board the neurodivergence train that the ASD community have led. And um, the end goal being about not wanting to be neurotypical and normal um, and uh, appreciating your neurodivergence for what it's worth. Um, yes, certain environments um, with ASD, for example, certain environments are for an aspect of someone's job that's really, really important to them and a really good fit. They might put everything they've got into um, some concrete approaches to social interactions to get past this one tricky part. Um, likewise with ADHD, we're not going to drain ourselves of resources every day trying to be neurotypical. We work a lot on um, acceptance that this is just the way it is and we want to find a good environment fit. Yeah. Um, the phrase neurospicy has come across my socials <laughs> lately and I really, really like that one. <laughs> You're well, spicy. It covers it all. <laughs> well, I think that's, uh, yeah, I think I asked a really confusing question. I apologise. I, I suppose I was thinking about what you guys have all been speaking about is particularly we're talking about adults, right? So they've got to where they are. They have managed and coped and, and, and you know, in the case study, just having a really difficult time. But it is incredible what people have managed um, on their own. So the, the adaptations they've made and the... Um, the workarounds and so forth. So I think, you know, you've, you've all talked a bit about rejoicing those and, and maybe building on them. So um, that will be great. I've got a couple of really specific ones that I might try and flick through before we go to, to recap. Um, yes, there'll be a recording of the session. I'm not going to answer all of those <laughs> questions. Um, I think this might be for you, Roger. Can stimulant medication trigger a psychotic episode? Uh, yes, in theory, but in practice, very rarely. Um, and they like when, I, when, I, when I first started in, you know, many years ago with all the stigma and what have you associated with stimulants, I was taught that one in four of my patients would become psychotic if I started them on dexamphetamine or Ritalin. One in four. So I, I started very cautiously. Now I would say I see a, perhaps a few a year where they've some paranoid ideation, perhaps a brief psychosis, if they've taken way too many, often associated with some marijuana. But in, in clinical practice, fortunately, it seems to be a very rare uh, occurrence. And um, if it does happen, it doesn't necessarily exclude patients from being on stimulants. If they've been on dexamphetamine, they could trial Ritalin, but you have to work closely with your local health department to get permission for that. Thank you. Um, Sorry, I'm just having a look. There's lots of different questions coming through. Um, I think 
One of the things that I was really interested in that you might want to speak about a little bit, because I've certainly experienced this as well with some clients I've worked with where this has been part of the mix, is that adult diagnosis and grief around lost potential, um, people that have been felt themselves or been told (laughs) that they never quite lived up to, you know, they're very clever child, they may be identified as even gifted and then never um, obtaining that because nobody then picked up that they weren't able to to complete tasks or so forth. So I was wondering about each of you, have you had those experiences and and where can you start with those? You talked a bit about grief, but just maybe chatting a little bit about that. John, did you want to chat about that? You're often front line with that. That's very important. I've learned that 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 can be the elephant in the room as well if you don't address it because once you've made a diagnosis and explained it to the patient, um, then they look back and think how my life might have been different. So I've learned very quickly to acknowledge that regret, tell them, yes, it's all right to have that regret, but you've got to let it go because you can't change the past, you can change the future. But while you're doing that, you can sometimes pick out some of the highlights of their life so far, which may be related to the positive side of their ADHD that they would not have otherwise achieved without it. Yeah, that's lovely. Maddie or um, Roger, just quickly before we go to wrap up, anything you would like to add about working with that? you know, a bit of the grief associated with... Well, I try and help people work with it in, in that they try and make the world a better place. Often they then join in with their local ADHD support group. Uh, they they start spreading the good good news about the condition. So um, I try and help them work with the grief, as you say, John, not to sort of dwell on it too much in the past, but say, all right, you know, how old's Ma- uh, Brianna? She's... Um, 40, 40, 36, well, she's probably only about a third the way through her life, the way life stats are going these days. So the first third has been pretty stormy, but she's done very well. The next two thirds, the sky's the limit. And we start to talk about hope and potential and uh, releasing the, the handicap side of AD, the ADHD, the, getting the, the lead out of the saddlebags, if you like, and who knows what might happen in the future. That's nice. Maddie, did you want to add anything? Yeah, look, I mean, probably a slightly different tact, and this is, you know, the psychologist in me. Um, we ultimately, the person needs to be able to make that shift of it's okay, I've got my future ahead of me, or, or um, you know, whatever the sort of more positive fruitful, useful narrative is for them. They need to be able to make that shift themselves. And for some, uh, it takes a little bit longer than others. But I feel this is where one of those ADHD um, strengths aspects comes in, because Yes, people can get hyper-focused on on something unpleasant, but they can also move on really quickly. And I'm always surprised we can have someone who's absolutely devastated, third session of being completely devastated, and they come back the next week and they've just switched totally into strengths mode and, and they're away. But I, I agree with um, with John and I think Roger ventured as well about um, pointing out their strengths angle. So at that point, I think when, when they're not ready our psychologists out there and other people that are no motivational interviewing stage of change model, we want to think about what they're ready for change wise. Are they ready to shift out of grieving when they uh, haven't been able to address that and reprocess um, the events of the past and how people have been treated them and the fairness or otherwise of that? Um, if, if they're not ready, you, you can't push. You just need to go gently with them, give them the validation they need. But if they're ready soaring ahead, you're just going to really annoy them by uh, focusing on on the grief part. So that, that's where that, that real skill in reading where your client is at. Um, comes in. Perfect. Thank you. Amazingly, we're almost out of time. So I'm going to ask you all in the last minute or so to, if you had one takeaway for the audience that have joined us tonight, that have been merely engaged in what you've all been saying, um, what would it be? 30 seconds or a minute. I'm going to go to you first, John. Uh, Think of the positives. Um, ADHD exists in human society in 5% minimum, some say up to 10%. Genes, to that extent, don't survive unless they have survival advantages in the long-term view of human history. So there are lots of pluses in there. Just look for them, nurture them, play to them, scaffold when you need it, but use your strengths. Beautiful. Thank you, John. Maddie. 
Uh, look, in a similar vein uh, to what John said, the um, for every good party you've been to, good intervention you've used, <laughs> <laughs> great holiday idea. There are ADHDers will undoubtedly be involved somewhere along there using that creativity, innovation, ingenuity. Um, so it, it's it's good to start looking out for it. Uh, neurodivergence is really, really important um, to where we've got to, but also the way out from where we've got to. Um, but the other quick thing I wanted to say is, is working in this space is a really fantastic population to work with and we need practitioners. Um, so please don't be uh, put off thinking it seems too complex. There are so many practitioners in this space that can give you great models. It's very practical and common sense. It's really rewarding and um, very sustainable, very sustainable work. Thanks, Join Matt. us, please. <laughs> Beautiful new guidelines to work with, which is always yes. nice when you've heard. Yes. And Roger, round us out with... Um, yes, the yes. Well, uh, the John and Matty have stolen my thunder. It's a very rewarding <laughs> condition to, to treat. I mean, that's how I got into it, and that's why I'm still doing it, because... Um, a lot of my colleagues say, oh, I wouldn't get involved in that. It's just drug-seeking behaviour. They want to come along and just get hold of Dexies and what have you. Uh, au contraire, they are very genuine, often coming to me reluctantly, and uh, I have to coax them into taking medication. But once they once they do, they engage with me, engage with, with uh, therapists and coaches. It is a very rewarding condition to treat. I would urge you all out there to sort of please start, uh, if you're not already, getting involved with the ADHD community. Embrace your neuro spicy, I think is the term yes. away from everyone. <laughs> um, all right, guys, we are at 8.27. Well done. We've done amazingly um, on time. Um, so I want to thank you all for your participation tonight and reassure everybody that, yes, the resources that we've spoken about, the slides and everything will be available. Um, and, yeah, embrace the community. The, the, the panellists have done a great job of pulling together those resources and places and spaces for you to connect and learn more. So please take advantage of that. Those of you wanting to know, we always want a statement of attendance that will come out to you. Um, you'll get the resources. Please, 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 please do the feedback survey it's really quick and we really do look at it it shapes what we do next um the topics the formats the uh discussion what you want more of and what you want less of so please either scan the qr code because we're very modern and up to date or um click on the link and, and fill out the survey because we do take great notice of it and it's really helpful for our panelists who give up their time to give them some, some feedback um okay so coming up next we have webinars from mhpn there's a podcast series. Check it out. Everyone loves a podcast when you're walking your dogs or driving along. I recommend them thoroughly. We've got uh, friends at Emerging Minds um, coming up on the 17th of November, supporting the social and emotional well-being of children with higher weight. So if that's of interest to you and your community, please join in. And the PHN series, non-medical supports and programs for older Australians. So spanning the lifespan there, which is fantastic. You can sign up through the MHPN website and if you get their news coming through so you'll never miss out on topics because they're always interesting as someone who's facilitated a few i learn something more, more than something a lot every time um, the MHPN Networks uh, is the partnership with this ADHD, which oh, you guys are killing me tonight, <laughs> working with the Australian ADHD Professionals Association to establish a new practitioner network. So those of you that are here tonight are obviously interested in this topic to bring practitioners together with a shared interest of ADHD. So we will send out information on that. So please check it out and share it with colleagues that may not have been able to make it tonight um, To because we all know the bigger the network in these fields, the better we all learn from each other and collaborate. Okay. And that, my friends, is just about it. Before we leave, I just want to thank everyone for participating and the panellists, of course, for their knowledge and expertise and time. And I'd like to acknowledge those people with the lived experience, people and carers who've lived with a mental illness and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present, those that care for and care for each other. Thank you so much, everybody, for your time this evening and we'll see you next time.